Welcome to this introduction to open educational resources. I'm David Wiley. This presentation itself is an open educational resource, and a link to the slides is available in the description down below the video. I'd encourage you to get the slides as there's a lot of additional information in the speaker notes that I hope you'll find useful. I've structured this presentation around a series of questions that I hope you'll find both interesting and informative as we enter into this world of open educational resources together. First, aren't OER just free online textbooks? Well, have you heard the joke about the Holy Roman Empire? This is attributed to Voltaire, who said that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. And what does this have to do with our question about open educational resources being free online textbooks? Well, we might echo Voltaire and say that OER aren't always textbooks, they aren't always online, and they aren't always free. Well, if that's the case, then what are open educational resources then? Well, the definition used by Creative Commons, as well as the William and Flory Hewlett Foundation, which has of course been a major funder in this area for many years, and other organizations, is this. Open educational resources are teaching, learning, and research materials that are either in the public domain or licensed in a manner that provides everyone with free and perpetual permission to engage in the 5R activities. Now, a few things to point out about this definition. First, open educational resources are resources that are either in the public domain or are licensed in a particular manner. That means that the definition of OER is centered solely on copyright. Open educational resources are resources that either aren't protected by copyright and are in the public domain, or are protected by copyright but are licensed in a particular way. Well, what does that license look like? First, that license has to grant us free and perpetual permission. In other words, there's no licensing fee that we ever have to pay. These permissions are granted to us for free and they're granted to us for as long as the copyright protection lasts. And it's permission to engage in what we call the 5R activities. So let's say uh, just a little bit about the 5Rs. The first of the 5R activities is retain. And this is really the foundational or fundamental uh, R of the 5Rs. And retain means that you have legal permission to make, own, and keep a copy of the resource. We're not talking about uh, a movie on Netflix that you can stream and that you have access to, uh, but that as soon as you stop paying your monthly fee, you lose access to it. We're not talking about something that you download that deletes itself after six months off of your device. We're talking about you being able to make a copy own that copy and keep that copy forever. Now, with that copy that you've had permission to make and to hold on to forever, you have permission to revise it. That means to edit it, adapt it, modify it in any way that you see fit. You have permission to remix, which means to take either your original copy or your revised copy and combine it with maybe chapters from uh, other books or videos from other sites, but to bring multiple resources together in order to create something new. Uh, fourth is reuse. You must have permission to either use your original, your revised, or your remixed copy of that resource publicly, which means posting it on a website, using it in a presentation like this, uh, using it in class. And finally, redistribute. You must have permission to share copies of either your original, your revised, or your remixed copy of the resource with others for free to just give away to them, uh, posting it online, giving it to a friend, whatever. If you have permission to engage in these five activities, and that permission is granted to you for free, and that permission is perpetual, then we would say we're talking about an open educational resource. So if open educational resources aren't always textbooks, aren't always online, and aren't always free, um, let's look at a couple of examples to illuminate these three points a little bit. For example, OpenStax is a very popular creator of OER textbooks. They definitely are textbooks, um, and they're available online and in print. This is a picture of the founder of OpenStax with several printed textbooks here. Now, these definitely are textbooks, but they are definitely not online, and they're definitely not free because ink and paper and shipping cost money. 
but we would still call these textbooks OER because their content is openly licensed. Another example, OER in adaptive courseware. Is this a textbook? No. Is it online? Yes. But is it free? No. However, we would still refer to it as OER because all of the content in the adaptive courseware is openly licensed. And a final example, interactive simulations. Are these textbooks? Definitely not. Are they online though? Yes, they are online and they're also free, but we would still call them OER because their content is openly licensed. Hopefully those couple of examples uh, clarify these points. So how can you tell the difference between something that's free and something that's open? Well, first look for a Creative Commons license. This is the most popular way that people express to you that they are granting you permission to engage in these five R activities. So if you see a Creative Commons license, the odds are high that the resource you're looking at is an open educational resource. And I'd also encourage you just to think about this uh, two by two table for a moment here. Here in the rows, we have resources that are licensed in different ways. And in the columns, we have things that cost different amounts of money. For example, in the yellow box at the top, resources that are licensed with a traditional copyright, all rights reserved, and that either are actually free or that students experience as being free. For example, resources in the campus library. Now, students pay for those resources through some kind of library fee, typically, but students' experience of those resources is they just walk in or they log on and they use them and they don't have to pay to use them. So students' experience of them is that they're free, but they're all rights reserved. Uh, in the gray box, we have material, for example, from traditional textbook publishers, which are all rights reserved uh, and which definitely cost more than zero dollars. Uh, down in the green box, we have, you know, here resources that are available for free and that are openly licensed, uh, licensed with a Creative Commons license that grants you those five R permissions. And so in this green box, an example would be something like open educational resources saved as a PDF that you can just make lots of copies of and send around for free uh, to anyone online. In the blue box, we'd have OER either in print or in courseware, still openly licensed, but um, with some cost associated with them. So things in the first column are free and things in the bottom row are open educational resources. There is a place where those two things overlap, but again, just making the point that not all open educational resources are free and not everything that is free is an open educational resource. Well, how much money do students save when their faculty adopt OER? Cost savings is one of the first things that people think about when they think about open educational resources. And the answer is it's complicated. You would think, uh, how can this be complicated? The savings is just you take what students used to spend and you subtract what they now spend and that gives you savings and that's very simple. But both the old spend and the new spend are kind of complicated to think about. In the case of the old spend, um, when we think about how much do all the required materials cost per course when faculty adopt traditionally copyrighted materials, and Spark has a very good estimate of this number at $134. And again, the uh, the links to these uh, to further detail are in the slide notes. So I'd encourage you to look there. Um, but if you look at what students actually spend per course when their faculty adopt traditionally copyrighted materials, the National Association of College Stores uh, has an estimate of about forty-seven dollars. So obviously, there's a lot of space between one hundred thirty-four and forty-seven. And these are asking slightly different questions, but these are both numbers that we might use as old spend when we calculate savings. And then how much is new spend? When students uh, are using OER that have been adopted by their faculty, students might pay for a printed copy. They might pay for a homework system that comes along with that or an adaptive platform. So the savings question really is much more complicated than it might seem at first. It might be this highest cost estimate and the lowest or the, the highest old spend estimate minus the lowest new spend estimate, or it might be something that looks very different. It could be somewhere from $130 that they save to 30 some dollars that they save. It's 
It's a very interesting question. There's a lot of interesting work that's been done here. But I think the answer to the question, how much money do students save? We know that they save money, but I don't think that we really know exactly how much they save. Well, won't free or very low cost materials be worse at supporting student learning than more expensive materials would? I mean, don't you get what you pay for? Um, the answer to this question is no. And that's true if you look at dozens of studies published in peer reviewed journals that in aggregate include over 100,000 students, these overwhelmingly show no significant difference in learning. Uh, sometimes the students who used OER have better learning outcomes than students that use traditionally copyrighted materials. Less frequently, but sometimes in those studies, traditionally copyrighted materials uh, users learn more than OER users did. But the overwhelming majority of these studies show no significant difference. Um, I would refer you to these two overviews of research on OER published by my colleague, John Hilton. Again, links are in the uh, slide notes. Well, don't OER improve student learning simply by expanding access to required materials? Um, you might say, we just answered that question. And you're right, we did just answer that question. The answer is no. Dozens of peer-reviewed studies published in peer-reviewed journals covering over 100,000 students overwhelmingly show no significant difference in student learning when faculty adopt OER. Now, uh, this quote by Herbert Simon, I think, is really helpful as we think about um, why this would or wouldn't be true. Herb Simon said that learning results from what the student does and thinks and only from what the student does and thinks. And the teacher, and by extension here, we'll say course materials, can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. So if all that you do is swap traditionally copyrighted materials for very similar but free OER, neither faculty's teaching practices nor students' study practices change. They both keep doing what they were doing before. Consequently, we should expect learning to stay the same as before because people are doing the same things they were doing before and we learn by doing. So in conclusion, open educational resources are either in the public domain or released under an open license. Number two, students save money when faculty adopt OER, but we don't know exactly how much. And number three, OER can improve learning for everyone only to the degree that they catalyze changes in teaching and study practices. And that's been a quick overview of OER. Thanks very much.